Okay. All right. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. I got Michael on the uh, with me on the podcast. Thanks, Mike, for tuning in. Um, I put my privilege. Amen. Um, last message I uh, it's titled the um, anointed seed of Jesus Christ. We talked about that seed remaining in us, what it is to be a real believer. Uh, the devil has duped the world, Michael, because they don't understand what it is to be born of God. If you're born of God, sin cannot remain because it's not in the seed. You know, when you plant a a uh, banana tree or you plant a uh, tomato plant, uh, you get a tomato plant when you plant the seed, you know, the herb yielding seed, Jesus said uh, in Genesis 1.11. Um, if there's no sin in Jesus, who's the seed, there's no sin going to be in us. We can't say we're in him when we live in sin. Sin must die. It was the first thing that happened when I got born again. I was a real believer. I had a 100% commitment. And I really believed that my experience was from God and heaven. He called me and transformed me. He did all the work. I didn't even know Bible verses. I didn't, I've never read the Bible. And he called me to do his work. The whole world is seeking for that happy place, Michael. Oh, yeah, they all want to be happy, really. But you can't be happy outside of the will of God. When you look at that passage Jesus spoke to in Matthew 7, 13, many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord. They thought they were Christians, Michael. Lord, Lord, look at what we've done. We've cast out devils. We've done mighty works. We've prophesied in your name. He said, I never knew you. Depart from me. Why did he say that, Michael? Because they weren't doing what God asked them to do. There's millions of people in this world doing what they want to do, and they think it's Jesus, but it's not good enough because God did not say do it. He did not make that assignment for their lives. You can be doing all kinds of things, but if Jesus didn't say to do it, you're a sinner. People don't understand that when he used that word iniquity or sin, it's basically the same thing. Michael, not doing the will of God is a sin. He said it was necessary to get to heaven by doing God's will, a specific will of God that he speaks to us. When I first got born again, I had no clue what Jesus was going to ask me to do, the assignment. And a young, bashful man at 21 years old, he asked me to do crazy things that were not within me. I just, there's no way I could do it in myself. It's just beyond me because I was bashful and shy. I was six months in the Lord, Michael. I didn't know hardly any Bible verses. And it doesn't matter. God is God, and he'll get it done. You just got to have a willing heart. Why did God say to David, this is a man after my heart? If you read the next passage after it, it says, because he wanted to do my will. That is the heart of God. It's all about doing the will of God, the specific assignment. And yeah, it's going to be scary. He asked me to after six months, I was out at a park. We were with, I went to a camp meeting in Pennsylvania. I've never been to one before, and it was a thousand people in this this building. And they have other uh, churches come and evangelists. And there was five evangelists lined up along the back, and a thousand people in the church. And uh, Jesus said to go out to the park and witnessed before the ser evening service at about 7 o'clock. And when I went out there, and I'm, I'm telling you the honest to God's truth, Michael, I started to tremble, and I didn't know what it was. I was out there witnessing to a, a man and a woman smoking weed. We were just talking to them about the love of God, and my body started to tremble and shake. I didn't know this was going to be the will of God. 
It was a specific assignment, Michael. I was out there and I started to shake and I started to talk to the Lord. Like, what are you, what's going on? I felt this power moving through me. And I had no clue at that time. It was God's assignment. It was going to be the staple mark of my future. And I started to tremble and the words of the Lord came to me crystal clear. And he said, I said to the other gentleman with what that was with me, which was a believer, we need to get back to the church service. It's around 6.30. It it's, uh, starts around 7. So we left there, and I was driving over there. He was driving the car. I was sitting in the passenger seat, and I was squirming like a worm, Michael. I, w I couldn't even control this power that was just, just whis whipping through me. It was just hard to control the power of God. And then as I drove back, he gave me the assignment. He said, Roger, when you get into that church service, go sit down. And right after the song service, I want you to get up out of your seat and start preaching to the hypocrites and tell them how wrong they are, that they need to repent. And so, Michael, I get in there. I am trembling. I am scared. And it doesn't matter. The will of God is going to be scary, Michael, because it's a lot deeper than we think. It's going to push our faith. Amen. And um, I got back there, got out of my seat, started preaching to these hypocrites for an hour. They were like white as, as a ghost, Michael, telling them they were hypocrites. The world around them was dying, and they're around in this church running around like crazy people, worshiping whatever they're worshiping. And uh, it was about an hour. I went behind the the uh, pulpit and grabbed those five hypocrites, preachers, 35 years in the Lord, and grabbed them by their coattails and shook them and told them to repent their whitewashed tombs, on and on. And then all of a sudden, as the assignment was done, the power left, and I was just a normal human being. And the words of Jesus came to me clearly. You've done what I asked you to do. Now go sit down. Michael, that was the assignment of God. I could be out casting out devils. I could be out prophesying. But if God didn't say prophesy, he didn't say go cast the devil out. He said to get into that church and rebuke hypocrites. And I never thought that would be my happy place. It's telling people they're wrong fixing what's wrong. You don't want to be a prophet, Michael, unless you're called because the dirt, the evil I see that has to be fixed and that most of it I hold on to and don't declare because I only want to declare what Jesus says to declare. It's not easy, Michael. Telling people they're wrong, rebuking hypocrites, laying prophecies on evil people's desks and false apostles and prophets and teachers telling they need to repent or they're going to perish. You better be called of God. You better, that better be your assignment. And when you do the assignment of God is your safety. You are saved. You're safe. It is the doorway into heaven. It is your future. So we have multitudes of people around the world professing the name of Jesus, whether they're hypocrites or not. If they're not doing the assignment, the will, the desire, the pleasure of God, what pleases God. Michael, that day when I pleased God and did what he asked me to do, and Jesus said, I will only do what the Father says. I will only say and do what he says. That's the will of God, a specific assignment. And it doesn't mean Bible verses. It means the words of God that come to us in our spirits. God communicated to me when I started to tremble in my body. He was talking to me all the way back to that church service. It was an internal dialogue. God talking to me, telling me what I'm to do. Call it words, of course. Now here's where Satan has duped the word, the world. He says, he calls it the word of God. Satan loves quoting Bible verses, but he can't. He doesn't know what's being spoken to me from within. Those are words from God. Now, there's a small difference between the words of God, uh, whether it be the Bible or something read in a church, but when it's an internal, 
internal dialogue. It's the words from God for my life, what he's telling me to do right now. And it's my responsibility and anyone that calls themselves a believer to be obedient. Now, I talked last, uh, last message on the anointed seed of Jesus Christ about the word abide, Michael. Let me just dive into that a little bit more. I want to use a few parables uh, in this message to try and explain, and this as clear as I can. When you, when you and I, and specifically I'll speak on my behalf, I own a business to where I have staff members and I have employees, and they come and go, as I said. But how do, when they come and remain, Michael, and stay, the word remains means to abide or stay working for me. I give them assignments, Michael. I tell them uh, daily, uh, weekly, I need this done. If they don't do what I say and do something else, their abiding place with me becomes in jeopardy. I may fire them if they do it again and again. And again, let me give you the secret to the word abide. You can't remain somewhere, let's say Jesus. You can't abide with Christ unless you keep his words. John 15. They are linked, Michael. Without action to the words of God, you can't remain with Jesus. Okay? It's, you won't last in my business. I call it fired. When you don't follow the assignment, what I'm asked to do. I didn't say file those. I said do this. I didn't ask you to wipe the floor or clean this in my business. I asked you to upload this information into the computer in my database. My employees are giving an assignment. And if they follow those words, words, they remain with me. If they don't follow those words, they will depart. Jesus used the word depart. The world says you are fired. We have to follow the assignment, Michael. And when Jesus said, you workers of iniquity, go from me, it means to go. You're not doing what I asked you to do. It's called sin. We don't see that as sin, Michael. If I didn't get out in front of that church and rebuke those hypocrites, and there was other situations that I did for Jesus all through my life, day after day, assignments of God come to me. We're looking for God on the outside. We're reading Bible verses that were spoken to other people, and those are important, Michael. We look at the Bible, and it's a teaching tool. tells us what pleases God, holiness, tells us what the carnal flesh is like. The Bible is very important. But we're talking about having fellowship with God and completing the assignment. Jesus was born into this world, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. He was born into this world with an assignment. To manifest the glory of God, heal sick, on and on, and then die on the cross. He had to do it, Michael. It's all that was on Jesus' mind. It's all that's on my mind is what's my assignment today. And we got to be listening clearly. If we're not paying attention to God and listening, we're missing out. We're sinning. There's sins of omission and sins of commission. The only thing uh, people today think is a matter is people that are in bondages to sin. You know, they commit crimes and they get addicted to this. But really, Michael, the deeper relationship with God is the assignment. If we're busy about the Father's business and doing the assignment, Michael, we won't be in sin. It's a trick of the devil. Amen? Amen. So when he spoke to them in Matthew Many will come to me, of course. Now, let me, let me share another parable, Michael. The Bible says, if you commit sin, you haven't seen Jesus or seen the Father or seen or know him, if you commit. 
sin. You haven't seen the Father. What is he saying about that? You don't know Jesus. You don't see Jesus. Well, who ultimately, Michael, is our uh, spiritual doctor? Who's our spiritual physician? Jesus Christ. But we, we've got to be honest with Jesus for him to fix us. Koinonia, which is the Greek word used for fellowship, it means communicate, communion, share with Jesus what's the matter. Share with Jesus, you can't escape your sin. I hate it, Lord, but I can't stop this addiction. When you go to see Jesus, Michael, it's not like going to a doctor. It's not like going to a heart specialist. Yes, they're schooled and telling you about the heart and giving you prescription meds, but that's a human being. When you go to Jesus, Michael, and you go see Jesus, you know what he's going to say? He's going to put the truth on the table. The truth is going to come out. When you go see an earthly doctor, they don't always tell you the truth. You may be dying of cancer. You may be have some sort of disease that he doesn't want to disclose because you just got married or whatever. There's deceit, Michael. There's not openness there's not sincerity and genuineness. When you go to Jesus Christ and you go see Dr. Jesus, okay, he's going to tell you right away all your sins because you can't have fellowship with God without the sin being gone. Amen? Amen. He's, gonna, he's got to tell you. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. When you go see Jesus and you close the door and you have that intimacy with God, fellowship, koinonia. First line of business is we got to clean this vessel up. Peter was shocked after Jesus was raised from the dead and he says, come on and dine. Come on, boys. Come on, disciples. Let's sit down. And they're all sitting down there having fish and bread. And they had no clue what Jesus was about. They said they saw Jesus three times and they didn't know it was him. So they sit down at the dinner table. What do we do today, Michael, when we sit down at the dinner table? We, everything is covered. We don't talk about what needs to be talked about. We don't talk about our hurt feelings and our bitterness. And you hurt me yesterday and you shouldn't have done that, dad, mom. And you need to stop talking to me that way. We don't talk about that. We cover it, Michael. That is not the way it is when you go see Jesus in the doctor's office. Jesus Christ's first line of business is to tell you where you're wrong. Can you imagine all these so-called Christians say, I love the Lord. I love you, Jesus. Hands worshiped in the air, shouting, screaming. And they say they love God. So Jesus sits down with Peter and John and all of the disciples. and They're eating away, and Jesus knows all things. And because he's an honest spiritual ph physician, he's going to criticize what needs to be criticized. He's going to criticize hypocrites. Peter was a hypocrite. If you break the word hypocrite down, Michael, you got hypo, which means above and you got crit or criticism, which means above criticism. These people today that think they know God are above criticism, Micah. You say something and they, they just won't accept the fact that they're missing, missing the mark with God. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus sits down with Peter and John, and Peter had a little envy and jealousy against John because... Jesus showed love to, P, uh, to John and said, this is the one whom I love. And Peter had a little jealousy, a little envy. He was carnal. He was not ready for the kingdom. He was not ready for the assignments. And Jesus is God. If he's going to have fellowship with Jesus, Jesus is going to be honest and sincere. First line of business is to expose the hypocrisy. Peter, you really love me? 
out of nowhere. They're looking at each other like, what? <laughs> Lord, you know I love you. In other words, Jesus brought it up because he didn't really love him. He loved himself. He didn't really love Jesus or he wouldn't have said it because Jesus don't lie. So because he said, do you love me? It means he didn't. Oh, then shh, feed my lambs. Ah, Jesus, still a hypocrite, still deceptive. Let me say it to him again. Let's see where this goes. Peter, do you really love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep the assignment. I don't care what else you're doing. You need to do my will, my predestined will for your life. You did what you wanted when you were young, but when you're old, you're going to do what I say. Well, what about John? It's none of your business. Stop being jealous of what I'm going to do with him. Stop being envious. Care about what I'm talking to you right now. We got to get rid of your hypocrisy. I'm going to say it to you again. Do you really love me with my love? You really love me with my love, a committal love to love my desires for your life. Yeah, that happy place. That wonderful plan to where I didn't make a mistake. It's perfect for your life. Peter, basically, you don't love me, do you? And he got mad and angry because the truth was on the table, Michael. And he got offended that the Lord would even think of asking him. You imagine me asking so-called Christians that walk around all day saying, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Do you really love the Lord? I'd be eating him with him at table. Do you really love the Lord? Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ is number one in my life. After the third time, Michael, they would get offended because they really thought they loved the Lord. Why do you keep asking me the same thing over and over, Roger? Amen? Amen. Now those two words, there's two words there that Jesus used with love. One is agapeo, which is the God kind of love, the committal love that Jesus showed, being about the Father's business and be willing to take it all the way to the cross and complete the call of God and die for, for the Lord Jesus Christ and the, or for the world and God. And then there's the other love, which means a love of a friend. Phileo, friendly love. I've had many friends, Michael. They come over the house once in a while. I don't have a whole lot at this point. I've had friends betray me, Michael. It doesn't matter how many years you've known them. Some of them are casual acquaintances. Uh, some of them is just on a friendly basis. Some might be more in a, intimate. But there's a friend that sticks close as a, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And Phileo is not talking about that. This Phileo love, a friendship love, which the world experiences, is not good enough with God. You have to have the agapeo love, the love that is willing to die for what you believe in. It's a 100% commitment. You have fully identified with Jesus Christ as your Lord. Notice when he said that in Matthew 7, 13. They said, Lord, Lord. That was already a hypocrisy statement. He was not their Lord. They were not under his authority. They were not obedient to his voice. Amen. Amen. They were living a hypocritical life that fell short of the assignment of God. They missed the mark. If you really look into that word sin, Michael, it means to miss the mark. Human beings can miss the mark in many areas. They were missing the, the mark with God's will and his assignment. Amen. Amen. And so if we want to have the koinonia, the fellowship, we got to be willing to communicate to Jesus the truth. And that's where I built my calling. I built my spiritual life. The kingdom of God has expanded within me because the words of God 
And Luke 8, 15, I believe, says it won't fall on good ground unless it's an honest and sincere heart. Sin seared from it. Everything is on the table. You got to tell Jesus how bad it is. He already knows. But to connect to him, and you got to have this agreement, you've got to agree with what God sees and knows. He knoweth our hearts, and he's greater than our hearts. If our hearts condemn us not, we have peace with God. Because we do, and we have what we say because we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We don't have condemnation. Condemnation's got to go. It's a work of the flesh. It makes you feel condemned, and you will be condemned when you go meet Jesus or see Jesus. You're, you're talking about going to see someone that's never sinned. You're talking about perfection. You're talking about going to see a spiritual physician that knows all things. And everything's going to be on the table. We don't get that in this world, Michael. The communication barrier is broken. Amen. We don't like to tell the doctor all of what we're feeling. We just tell the doctor what we think we talked about. And here's the next thing, Michael. People uh, uh, go to doctors around the world for years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever the amount of time is. When you go to the doctor today, why would you talk about something that was 20 years ago in your conversation? You're going to talk about what's now. Faith is now. Faith is now. Let's have a dialogue about what I'm going through right now. What I talked to Jesus about a month ago isn't pertinent to me now. He took care of it. He drove out whatever sin it was. The assignment was different. The assignment is different today. What I'm feeling and what I need to present to Jesus today is not going to be the same words 20 years ago, 15 years ago. It's going to be what's going on now in my life, what's going on now in the ministry. What he wants from me now will be on the table. Amen. Amen. This is, this is how we connect with God. We can't have fellowship with God if we're not willing to tell Jesus. I've had physical issues, Michael. I bring them to God. What's up, Michael? Or what's up, God? This pain I'm going through fogs my mind, and for me to do your work, I've got to have a clearer mind, and then Jesus takes care of it. I tell Jesus all the truth. Every cotton picking thing. That's where purity comes in. When he talked in John 15, he said, my, By my words, you are clean. Now listen to this carefully. That word, clean, Michael, if you really study into it, it means my relationship with Jesus is clear. Hear me? The word clean makes things clear, fixes what was wrong between me and Jesus. You know how many people carry around bitterness their whole lives and are not willing to talk about it? You know how many people carry around jealousy, envy, and don't want to talk about it with Jesus or anyone? They think they can carry that around and they can know God. When you go to see the spiritual physician, Jesus, you won't have sin remaining anymore because the first line of business, his words are going to get things cleaned up between you and him. It's going to get cleaned up. The sins that you're hiding have to be fixed and exposed. And it's going to clear up your relationship with Jesus Christ in a heartbeat. He talks about it in 1 John. You say you have not sinned. You're a hypocrite. I know you've sinned. I'm greater than your own heart. You don't even know your own heart, people. 
You don't even know. Your pride has blinded to you to your own darkness. I'm not letting you in. I taketh you away. You're not allowed to be in my company if you don't want to talk about the truth. We need to clear up our relationship. Clean. We need to clear up our relationship. Roger, Michael, whoever. It's all the first line of business with Jesus Christ. It's broken. It needs to be fixed. These little sins you're hiding, I already know, but I'm the one that paid the penalty for your sins and removed it. You just don't believe I can do it. You need to come to me boldly. Hebrews 3 or 4 it is. I think it's 4, Hebrews 4. Come to the Lord boldly. He sees all things. He knows what's a matter. You're going to come see Jesus, the first line of business, come with boldness. Don't come in fear. Don't come thinking nothing's going to happen. You need to believe that when you bring it to God and you open your mouth and confess it and tell Jesus and want this relationship fixed, he'll fix it. He does it 100% of the time. God is faithful to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and restore your fellowship. Things are clear now, Raj. You're not mad at me. You're not bitter towards somebody. You're forgiven. You don't blame me anymore. It's all on the table, Michael. So that word, he said, you are clean through the word I have spoken unto you. The Bible wasn't around. He's not talking about Bible verses. He's talking about the spontaneity, the the now, the words I'm talking to you now. You need to let me clean you up. You need to tell me what's the matter. It's personal words that are spoken to us as individuals that come to us time and time again. So much of the world and the apostates and hypocrites have a, have a desensitized conscience, Michael. They don't even know what the voice of God is. They have no clue that the Holy Spirit is here to convict the world of sin and unbelief. That's his job, is to keep... Uh, when, when Saul was on the road to Damascus, what did Jesus say? And he got knocked off his horse. And, uh, and Jesus said, who is... Or Paul, uh, Saul said, who is this? He said, it's Jesus whom you're persecuting. Isn't it hard, Apostle Paul, to kick against the goats? Kick against the pricks, the conviction? I'm calling you. Forget, your life's over. You might as well obey me. This is the assignment. Well, what do you want me to do? Uh, do this. Go into the city. Da 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 da. Preach my gospel. On and on. And then the sk- his eyes got healed. He was blinded for a season. And his eyes got healed. People think God is some man, some wimpy, like God's commandments are not what he meant. Commandment means God's sayings or his words that he really meant. God is serious. When he says it, he means it. He's not like a mother and father today that don't hold true to their word until they say, until they get angry when they address their child and said, son, I, or Matthew, I want you to go take care of this. And then they don't do it. Matthew, Michael, I told you I wanted you to go do this. Now, I mean it. Go do it now. And then 10 minutes go by, he hasn't done it. Matthew, Michael, John. Now you got the three words. First, the middle, and the last name. I mean it. I'm serious. If you don't do it, you're going to be punished. Very few parents hold true to that, Michael. It's not that way with God. He's faithful. If God said it, you better fear. You better move. Get out there and preach to the hypocrites. Roger, I told you to make a phone call. I told you to take care of this. You need to take care of it. I meant it. My commandment is the command I meant. It's serious. I am not a man. I am an all-consuming fire. I'm going to present to you the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. And the greatest part, Michael, and it's been my pursuit, and I believe yours over the 
last uh, many years is seek the truth because God is the truth. And when you seek the truth and want the truth, it's always going to be on the table with Jesus. So we go to the Last Supper, Michael. They think they're going to have a wonderful time. Just cover everything they're feeling. Expose nothing. Let's not clear up any problems here. Let's not let the cleaning of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ and God the Father expose anything. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And they just thought it was going to be a wonderful dinner. And they're sitting around there, the 12 apostles and disciples. And Jesus is starting to see things in the Spirit and says, Oh boy, wow, one of these is going to betray me. There's one of you who hear that it's going to betray me. <laughs> is it me, Lord? Is it me? The one who dips with me at the same time in the cup is the one that's going to betray me. Can you imagine that, Michael, going to see a doctor and he go to see Jesus and he doesn't tell you how wonderful you are? doesn't tell you about all your accolades and thank you for casting out devils in my name. Thank you for prophesying. Thank you for those mighty ministry works of feeding the poor and handing out tracts, standing on the side of the road with a big sign saying repent or perish, doing all these things Jesus never asked you to do. And they sit down there and they're blown out of their minds, Michael. They thought it was going to be just a wonderful time of fellowship with Jesus, and they never realize that to have fellowship with Jesus is always about getting to the bottom of the truth, clearing up what's separating us, cleaning up what's between us. It's got to be talked about. Michael, I have built my spiritual kingdom within me. I have built this. I have seen the seed of God grow within me by keep coming to the Lord's table and let him tell me exactly what is a matter with me. And after he cleans it up, he gives me assignments and I have a hearing ear and always will have a hearing ear for Jesus Christ's assignment. Otherwise, he will say, go away. Depart from me. All of your religious chatter, your Lord, Lord, telling me what you've done is nothing I asked you to do. You don't know me. Because if you came to see me, you wouldn't be in sin. You might be going to see the devil, a doctor of the world. You're not going to get the truth all the time. You come to see me, you'll get to know me. And when you get to see me, we're going to take care of your sin because I'm going to expose every single one of them. I'm going to tell you what's a matter between you and me because ultimately that's what God wants, us to remain and stay abiding with him by letting his words purge, clean, fix, clear up, drive out, Anything that the flesh wants to have and live, it's got to go, it's got to die for us to have that relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's what we want. It's our happy place. The first happy place, Michael, when I got born again, it was a complete transformation. The first day I was on cloud nine, I was such a happy man. No matter what I did, my college education, nothing could compare to the born-again experience, being born from God, born out of holiness. That seed of holiness, that seed of being born from God cannot be sin, cannot be sin, never will. It's going to be obedience. I love doing the will of God, no matter how hard it is, Michael. You think I like criticizing hypocrites? You think I like critiquing? You think, but Michael, I never thought that my happiness would be found in rebuking hypocrites and 
taking up that call of God, despite the mockery, the hatred, the, the horrible hate that comes from these people when you tell them the truth. I never thought that that was my happiness. We think it's laying on a beach. We think it's a race car. We think it's a beautiful home. The devil has duped the world. World, Michael, and I want to end with this. And I have no disregard for the Word of God, the Bible. It's a history book of what God said, did, and, and the people that followed or rebelled against him and the New Testament and his own blood. And It's wonderful that we have it here. It's in every hotel room. It's wonderful, Michael. But we can't live on Bible verses that were spoken to Peter in John 21. That was Jesus and him having a personal conversation about the fact he didn't love Jesus. He's not talking to me per se. He could be if I'm a hypocrite and I don't love Jesus. Amen. But we're looking on the outside instead of looking on the inside. A born-again believer has an internal dialogue that's going on, whether they're paying attention to it or not. They get scared of the assignment. They get scared of the sayings of God. They get scared of the commandments and the word of God, so they don't obey, and it starts the sin process of disobedience, not obeying the will of God. It's a sin, period. We don't think it is. Sins of omission. We pick and choose what we want to do for God, and we do things he didn't ask us to do, and we're afraid to do things he asked to, to, us to do. It's sin, Michael, plain and clear. And when we don't obey, take it to God and tell him you're sorry immediately and ask him for faith to carry it out next time. I was scared to say that to my mother. I wanted to tell her real bad, but you know what? I didn't want to hurt her feelings. Tell Jesus you sinned. Tell Jesus you made a mistake. You missed the glorious opportunity that he put before you to say what he said to say and do what he asked you to do, to remain in that abiding place with Jesus Christ. And when we do what he asks us to do, Michael, we can ask anything. We will, and he will do it. Because there's no sin you don't got to go through the filter of sin, which starts to distort the assignment of God. When you're abiding in him and you're living sinless, sinless, everything is crystal clear. It's clean. The dialogue with God is uninhibited by sin. It's not blocked. There's no veil. It's not foggy or distorted or diverted. It's straight up the truth. Tell the truth just as he said to you. Now you speak it. Amen. Amen. Praise Jesus Christ, Michael. Praise Hall God. Hallelujah. Amen. The, the devil has duped the world, thinking that Bible verses get you to heaven. If we know enough of Bible verses, we go to heaven. No. You got to do the will of God. The will of God is not Bible verses. The will of God is an assignment for you as an individual. Before the foundation of the world, you were given an assignment. Jesus will always make you enjoy it. Apostle Paul said, I finish this course with joy and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify of the gospel of his grace. Joy! Jesus said, the joy that was set before me, I endured the cross. So where is the joy, Michael? In the center of God's will for your life. Not Bible verses. The spontaneity, the now, the words that come to you on a daily basis in your dreams while you're laying there and you're meditating, God is speaking. Those are the words you have to obey. It's a new dialogue. God is writing on the tablet of your heart. He's marking it in your mind. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing God speak to you from within. Hear me, Michael. 
Faith comes by hearing God. Okay, Lord. And hearing more of God. All right, Lord. That's the third time you told me to do that. I'm getting faith. I'm getting stronger, and I'm getting more willing to do it, Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing God tell you what he wants you to do. And he gives you the faith. As you keep hearing it, you start to believe in it. And when you start to believe in it, and then the next day he tells you again, you hear it again. You haven't taken care of it yet. He speaks it to you again two days later, a week later, a month later, a year. It doesn't matter. Take care of it. The reason he's saying to do it over and over is because he wants you to believe he's serious. I said it. Just do it. It's no time to be timid. It's no time for excuses. It's time for you to love me as I love you. Oh, yeah. Don't say you love God when you won't listen to his words and his assignment that he gives to you on a daily basis. The world is underdeveloped spiritually. The hypocrites and apostates are underdeveloped spiritually. They don't even know that God is talking to them about, about something. God has thrown them out a long ago. What does a doctor do if a patient doesn't abide by his words? I need you to take these two pills. I need you to read this book, and I need you to take care of that. I need you to go get an echocardiogram. I need you to go get the blood work. When you don't do it, you won't be with that doctor anymore. You'll be cast out. Depart. That's not a patient of mine. A person walks into a doctor's office, Michael, and he looks at him and says, I've never seen you before. I don't know who you are. What, what do you, who, what's, who's this person? No, they were thrown out the door a long time ago. He doesn't know them, Michael, because it's based on following the instructions of your medical doctor. Keeps you seeing him and knowing him. He that sinneth hath not seen Jesus, or even knows Jesus. Not happening. Amen. Amen. So, Michael, I don't mean disrespect to you listening to this broadcast. The Word of God, I've built my life on the Word of God. I've built my life on reading the epistles of apostles. It's gotten down into my heart. It's helped shame, uh, shape and form who I am. It is. It is God. It's spirit. We need to learn how to live in the spirit, Michael. It's really easy to identify a car, to identify a house, things we see with our eyes. It's easy to identify a lake, a boat, a tree. We see it. We call it what it is. We need to pay attention to our spirits because the real part of us is our spiritual man. We're out of touch with our spiritual man. We're dead in our sins. And when we're dead in our sins, we're out of touch with the spiritual life of God. It's made, sin makes void that relationship. We remain dead spiritually. There's no life. We can't hear God. And to come to back to God, the only words Jesus will accept is repentance. God does not hear sinners it's throughout the Bible. So if you're going to come to God as a sinner, a hypocrite, apostate, the only words he's going to accept before you, he opens the door back up is tell him how bad you've been and how wrong you've been and your hypocrisy and your weep as long as you got to weep and Tell Jesus the nastiness and the disobedience to his orders, and on and on you can go. And when you pour out your repentance and your confession of sin from sincerity, you really want to be done with it. You really want it over. It's the only words he'll accept from a hypocrite. 
a so-called Christian that is not a Christian. It's the only words, and he says it in Revelation 3.18. To confess it, listen to me. You say you're rich and increased with goods and need nothing. I say you're poor, miserable, not blind and naked. If you want to have sup with me, if you want to dine with me, I'm standing at the door and knocking. You got to tell me the truth. Spill your guts before God. Tell him all of the horrible darkness. He'll clean you up in a heartbeat, and then you'll be on your way. The voice of God will start to become clear, crystal clear. Your relationship with Jesus is cleaned up. Praise God. Praise God. When I was... I, I got to tell you this, uh, to throw this into the mix here. I, 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 li I speak these things by experience, Michael. I was a bad dude, not horrible. You know, I didn't commit any like crazy crimes, but I was a sinner, man. Really bad in my days, I, you know. And um, I had a, I, I didn't like a beer or whatever, but I was at a bar one time and I had like 12 beers. I was wasted out of my mind and I got... I felt the call of God on my life, not only at 10 years old, but around 18 or so, partying and going to bars once in a while, and smoking my weed, and I know all about it. It's absolute darkness. It's, it's horrible. It's not happiness. It's death. And I got wasted one night and could hardly drive home. I lived right around the corner from this bar. And the Spirit of God, it must have been the Spirit of God. I got home, got into my bed, and I was weeping and got on my knees in the middle of my bed and screamed out to God, cried out to God, I hate my life. I hate being drunk. I hate being stoned. I hate this horrible life. I don't want it anymore. And Michael, I was so stoned and wasted out of my mind. And after I confessed my sin and my hatred for who I was, I hated this life. I wanted change. I told this all to Jesus. I wasn't born again. Michael, within five minutes, I was completely made straight. At a hot honey came down over the top, like a hot honey, a feeling of warm heat came down off the, off the top of my head to my feet. And I was just flabbergasted. I didn't know what happened to me from being completely stoned and wasted, had no, completely gone. In five minutes of confessing my sin and my hatred for the life I have, and I wanted a change, and I'm done with this. Please, God, if you're out there, Come and save me. Michael, God heard those words of repentance even as a sinner. But those were the only words Jesus Christ would hear. And when I told Jesus the truth, because he is love, he responds, Michael, he is so kind and so loving to deliver me. And when that hot honey feeling come down over the top of my head, to the bottom of my feet, Michael, I was made straight. And the next day, Michael, I was like a new man. It was like unbelievable. It was the starting seed for me to continue to pursue God and pray morning, noon, and night and to begin to follow this path that he predestined for me. I had a dramatic experience. Some believers don't. I just happened to have a dramatic experience to where it just overwhelmed me. I was in love with Jesus, in love with God's path. I was willing to do anything for Jesus Christ. And we need to get to that place to hear his words, his words of instruction, his words that he is asking us to do for his name's sake. That shows our love for Jesus Christ. And I want to end with this, Michael. You know where the problem starts? Is we don't believe God really loves us. If we really believe that God loves me more than I love myself, we would trust him 
and trust the process with all of our hearts. He will never lead us astray. He will never be unfaithful to his love for us. Satan is the exact opposite. He hates us. He will never be faithful to any of the lies he dangles before human beings. He cannot and never will. It's impossible for Satan to fulfill his lies. Impossible. So stop believing him. So we come back. We just don't believe God loves us. His love is above man's love. His love is perfect. It is. He wants you happy. Just trust him. His happy place is built within his call. He did it before he created you. No matter what you think, you got to believe the love of God is taking you to a place of ultimate joy in keeping his commandments. We have fullness of joy. John 15, 11. Love as he loves you in this is fullness of joy. You've got to trust in the love of God. I beg you people, throw yourself at his altar of mercy. Let him take care of your sins and let him clean you up. Tell Jesus all of it. You have to tell all, otherwise sin still remains. Stop being afraid. Come boldly to the throne of God and find mercy and grace in your time of need. You're a sinner. You can't escape. You think it's okay. God accepts you as a sinner. You plan on sinning. That's what you need. You need mercy. You need to tell Jesus the truth. You got to come boldly. You got to spill it. You got to tell it. And Michael, I see my harvest today. I, I, I can't speak on others' behalf. I've seen Jesus grow his kingdom within me and grow his anointing because of my obedience and spilling everything, being honest and open and keeping things clear and clean before my Lord and Savior so that we can have wonderful communication. And I won't miss his assignment and I will be obedient to all of his words, all of it. And I am willing to suffer the persecution. I am willing to suffer the hatred and the anger. And I'm not, I don't care if I offend anybody because God said to do it. That's the only time I, I, I won't offend anybody if, if, if it's something minor. I'll try and avoid uh, eating and drinking things that will offend others that don't believe in it. I've talked about that. But when God gives me the assignment, Michael, I don't care who it offends. I expect it to offend, but it's worth it because I'm trying to see through the eyes of the love of God. He loves the world, not just me. When that hot honey came down over me, he wants to do that with everyone in the world. He wants his love to shine. He wants others' eyes to be open that are in bondage to the apostate church those that are trapped, that are trying to escape, crying out, is there any truth out there? It's a wilderness, Lord. Is anyone telling the truth? Please, Jesus, where's the truth? There comes Roger. There comes the prophet. Because God is love. We've got to love the world like Jesus loves them. We can never give up, Michael. We've got to keep casting the seed. It's incorruptible. Amen. It keeps, it keeps working. There's family members of mine, and they listen to these tapes, Michael. The Lord said they are. Uh, that asks my wife periodically, how's Roger doing? Uh, is, he, is he still preaching? Um, does he have like a website where messages we can listen to? Oh, yeah, yeah. And she'll give him the website address and, Michael, you'd be surprised. The seeds we sow today are entering into other people's fields that have sown. 
we're labor together. We sow, we scatter seed. And that's what it is. We're sowing the words of God. His words will not return void. They are sent out on an assignment specifically for those that need to hear it, to come and drink. Come, come, come as you are, here, here. Let it build your faith to obedience and trust that expect. The word hope, and I want to end with this, the word hope means cheerful expectation. When I came to Jesus, I hoped and had cheerful ex expectation that he would take care of my sins. I didn't come to Jesus expecting anything other. My hope was that God would do what he said. I expected to be delivered from a sinful life and the desires to sin when I came to Jesus and spilled my guts, told him everything, told him all the truth. I hoped, I expected with cheerful hope that I would be free from this bondage that I hated, that I wanted to be rid of, that I couldn't do on my own. I completely expected and believed that Jesus Christ would remove it. And when you come with that expectation, he does it. The reason people are still in sin, they don't believe God will be faithful and will do it. They don't believe they can live above sin then you don't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't you dare call yourself a believer. Don't you dare say you know God. And don't you dare call him Lord. He's not your Lord. You're your Lord. You are the boss, not Jesus. Because if you expect it to be delivered from sin, when you come to Jesus, you will be delivered from sin. Michael, living holy is easier than living in sin. Sin was hard. I had a conscience that bothered me. I kicked against the pricks. I, to I was tormented. It was very difficult. The devil's a hard taskmaster. Sin is very difficult to continue to do until you get desensitized to it. There's a part of us that has goodness in the conscience. It was hard to be a sinner. It's easy to be a saint. It's easy to be holy, Michael. It's easy. The seed remains in me. I cannot sin. If Jesus abides in me, my relationship with Jesus, koinonia, is clean and clear. I obey all of his words. I do what he asks me to do. I call a person and have him over to talk to him about God or whatever he asks me to do, whatever assignments. I'm living free from sin. I'm not committing sins. I'm not omitting what God has ordered me to do. It's easy to be a saint because God's grace is in complete control of my life, keeping me clean, empowering me to live holy. It's easy. Learn of Jesus Christ. He's meek and lowly, and you'll find rest unto your soul. His yoke is easy. Your religion is hard. All of the works you do has manifested more sin. You're in bondage. You think you got to do more works to be free from sin. You think you got to read more Bible verses. You got to go to church services. You got to pay so much money. You got to do all of these carnal things. When it comes so simply and easy by the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ alone, I am free from sin. Apostle Paul said all of his years of religion was dung. It was a waste of time and worthless. It was horrible, horrible, horrible deception. But now he realized the simplicity that his faith gave him the righteousness of God, born from God, born out of God, cannot be sin. Born of God is not a one-time act, Michael. Born of God is a daily process. That seed is springing up. Everything that comes out of me is born from God. 
The word born there means come into existence or to become something or someone. Every day I'm being born from God. What comes out of my mouth, this message is born from God. It's not my words. I didn't sit around writing this up and or looking back on books and this is born from God right now. I'm not reading a script. These are words born from God. Come on, people, hear me. You tuned into this broadcast for a reason. We're not wasting our time. I plead with you to hear my simplicity about what it is to really be born of God. Very few people are born of God. You would know right away if they're born of God. Trust me, it's a new species of being. You've never seen this individual before. He's completely transformed. Everybody will be talking about you. I cannot believe this guy. He's unbelievable. He's from another world. You better believe it. This home is not my place. I don't belong here. I'm from heaven. I'm here for a short stint to do the assignment of God and leave and go back to the one who made me, who I've been with since the beginning. I've been with Jesus Christ since the beginning. Praise God. Praise Jesus Christ. Amen. So come on, people. Stop the religion. I didn't disrespect God by talking to you about the Bible versus hearing the words of God within us. They're both important. But Satan is in the brilliant business of deception, thinking because you know Bible verses, you're safe. Because you're quoting Bible verses, you're going to heaven. Or you're quoting Bible verses that you know God. No. The issue is the sin separates you from God. Reading Bible verses doesn't excuse your sin. It's obedience. So I want to go back to the last original words when I started this podcast. The word abide, Michael, means we abide by acting in accordance with God's word. The word abide means to abide in his words. You don't stay with God or remain with God unless you have the other portion of the word of abide. Action. Doing what you're told to do, you remain. Doing what you're told to do, you remain. That is the depth of the word abide. If you don't do what you're asked to do, you are not remaining with God. You're not remaining. Stop saying you abide. He taketh away those that don't let his word clear up fix your relationship abide by his words tell jesus the truth amen, amen. that's what that's what keeps us abiding with him stop saying you know god when you live in sin you're starting blasphemy you're saying words that are untrue it's called sin don't say something unless it's true. Don't say you're in him when you're in sin because there is no sin in him. If you're a saint, say it so. If you're a sinner, say it so. If you're a hypocrite, say it so. If you're a, an apostate, say it so. That's your beginning of your freedom and your happiness in God to continue to bring forth fruit from that seed. Those words, what is God's, what is a seed? In God's eyes, his words. His words spoken are seeds. That's got to spring up and bear fruit. I am living today of the fruit of the words that Jesus has spoken to me, Michael. That is the fruit, my obedience receiving the words of God, which are seeds, have sprung up and are bearing fruit. You see it, you hear it in this message. My wife sees it, my family. 
the world sees it, the world knows it. That is the fruit of the words God has spoken to me over 40 years. Some 30, some 60, some hundredfold. That is the happy place for every believer. It's to remain in God. Stay with it long enough. Don't doubt the process. Let Jesus Christ fulfill his dreams in you. Be obedient to his words. He's going to ask you to do things that are a little scary. But that's okay. Ask him to give you more faith. Carry it out. Do what he's asked you to do. He's going to push you. It wasn't easy to do all those things he's asked me to do over the years. Put prophecies on hypocrites' desks. Do things that no one else wanted me to do. But Jesus Christ gave me the faith. I was trembling. I was scared to speak some of those prophecies. I, have an, I am a natural man as well. But the faith of God within me, get in touch with your spirit, man. That's where the faith is. Believe God and obey his words, his individualized words, his assignment, his spontaneity now, faith. Listen, I'm telling you now what I want. Believe in the now, Roger. Thank you for remembering Bible verses, but I'm telling you I want you to do something right now. Because I'm telling you to do it now, believe in it. Believe in me. Believe what I'm asking you to do is going to be fruitful. It's not going to be a waste of time. And just do it. Just do it. Praise God. Praise Jesus.